What we've got here is the full recording from our draft show that we did earlier in the year. We unfortunately didn't get it up in time for it to be super relevant right after the draft. We did do a couple of excerpts from this that are on YouTube. Uh, but this is the draft show in its entirety. Again, so sorry for not getting it out there, but at least now you've got a little something to hold you over until the season starts. Keep an eye and an ear out for us. We're going to do a lot of preview stuff leading up to the season. And then obviously every single week we're going to hit you with the content that you love for SEC football. So without any further ado, here you have it. You thought we left you forever. We just took a break in the off season. I've got Husky Pup with me once again. We are back because a little something happened last week. I think it was the NFL draft. It was, and this is a great time to talk about it. We're in the off season. We're through the spring spring games, and now we've got a little bit of meat to chew on, and that is a discussion of not only what we saw in the draft, but how this is going to affect teams in the SEC going into the 2017 season, and maybe a little discussion about who to look for in 2018. So let's get into it. First, I want to thank everybody obviously always uh youtube and the podcast and this is probably going to be a long one so if you want to hear the whole thing you don't want to have you don't have time uh to watch the whole thing on youtube then check out the podcast at secfans.com it's the same audio that we're going to have in the video here uh, i know a lot of people like to listen to us in their car uh so that's always a good choice so getting right into it going to talk about the draft first uh a little bit of a general discussion husky tell me what you think in terms of what we saw in this draft uh in the 2017 draft in terms of how it reflects on not only the team that was that that these players came from um and, and maybe talk about that and also the perception of what it's going to do to that team going forward and i maybe to to put a finer point on that if a team loses a lot of people in the draft uh is it safe to assume that they're they're gonna suck the next year because they're gonna replace a lot of top tier talent so i know there's about 107 questions to get you started and you're probably still rusty but uh go ahead and jump in those uh whichever order you want to answer them and then let's get going the reality of the draft is it is sort of a double-edged sword i think when you have a lot of players go in the draft obviously that means you're losing a lot of talent but it also means that there's a certain amount of respect from the NFL for the talent that you lost. So, you know, in a nutshell, I think long term, you're always good to have a lot of guys go in the draft because it does genuinely affect recruiting. Uh, it is a sign of the fact that you're able to develop players, that everything is going well, that you're bringing in good talent. That's all a good long term, healthy thing. Uh, and it again, because of the re recruiting perspective, I think it kind of snowballs and it builds on itself. Uh, the flip side to that argument is when you have a lot of guys going in the draft, that also means that you lost a lot of talent. Now, the way I've always looked at it is you kind of want your talent loss to be commensurate with the success that you had. In other words, you know, if you were a playoff team, you probably had a lot of talent on your squad. And that's, you know, to be expected that you lost a lot of guys in the draft or that you had a, a good quote unquote draft. Um, I also think it's often a good sign if you have a team that's very successful and doesn't have a lot of draftable players, because at the end of the day, that means you coached your guys. Well, you did really well with the pieces you had. It's a good sign of the coaching staff. Now, again, it's a good sign that you were able to accomplish as much as you did with the talent you had. Um, maybe it's a sign that your coaching staff isn't doing a very good job of getting talent into your program, but you know, at least you had a successful season with a talent level. What I think is really bad is if you have a team that did not achieve a high level of, you know, success in a given season and they have a lot of guys drafted. I mean, that's that's a bad thing. So give me an example off the top of your head. I know we didn't discuss this ahead of time. And for those of y'all who are wondering, we're kind of just. I don't know, a little, a little free will in this one. We're, we're, we're not pre-planning this discussion. We're just kind of seeing where it takes us. And so I'm going to drop a surprise question on you. I, I kind of had an idea that's where you're going to go in terms of your answer. But I want to know in this draft, maybe now, maybe 
in years prior. What's a good example of a team that illustrates the point you just made where uh, a team that has a lot of talent go in the draft, but it reflects, reflects poorly on that team or maybe that coaching staff because they didn't get it done on the field? I think maybe a good example this year is probably Miami. Uh, I think Miami had the third most players drafted. Uh, they had eight players drafted in the draft this year, um, ended up with a 9-4 and four record which isn't bad, but that nine and four record only actually had one ranked win. And I think, you know, I'd already looked this up actually, because I thought this was a really interesting statistic. A, a lot of people are kind of, I guess, critical into the year about Kirby smart. They had an eight, eight and five record. Some people had high expectations, but Georgia had one draftable player from this past season. They had one guy get drafted and that was Isaiah McKenzie, the, smallest receiver that they used to do a million things. Uh, some of which like the uh, Vanderbilt attempted conversion was a little questionable, but you kind of see why they did that when you realize he was the only guy that got drafted off that roster and Mark Rick, who people look at and go, Oh, we'll see, look at the success he had in Miami. And he had eight guys drafted. So it, personally, I think a really good example is Miami. And I think the perception of where they are and where they're headed under Mark Rick Maybe you need to take a step back, especially since he's a first year coach. I mean, let's understand Mark Rick didn't suddenly, you know, in the eight months he was there, teach all these guys how to play football uh, such that they could be drafted as NFL prospects. Most of every development they had, they had going into this past season. So with that in mind, Mark Rick actually inherited a pretty darn good team with, you know, almost half the starting roster being draft ready players immediately. Um, and then he had a what what ended up being a pretty promising ending up being just merely averagely successful season. And on the flip side, you know, everybody's critical of Kirby Smart, but Mark Rick left Kirby Smart with a team that was almost totally devoid of NFL ready draftable talent. Uh, and I think that's a pretty good example of, you know, maybe Georgia fans are disappointed at their draft, but I wouldn't look at it that way. I would look at it and say, you know, Kirby Smart did a really good job of what we had. We didn't lose as much as maybe we might have thought we would going into the season. And likewise, I think maybe Miami fans should take a step back and realize they're losing a lot more than you would expect to lose off a, te a, a team with their record from last year. And I think, you know, uh, it maybe veers a little bit away from the draft, but uh, Georgia fans may have had a little too high of an expectation uh, with the first year of Kirby Smart, I think they were thinking that they were fully loaded with talent and that Rick was the problem, not the talent that he left him with. But some of that can be attributed to the fact that you, you, you might recruit great. You might have, you might be five star city, but those five stars become three stars really fast once they're not developed you know, by that coaching staff. Do you think that some of what we saw at Georgia under Mark Rick, based on what you just said and based on what we saw in the draft? Um, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think they have sort of been trending down. You know, Georgia has a large number of players, I think fourth or fifth in the NFL number of NFL players, which is kind of crazy when you think about the fact that they haven't as much as they've been really, really good and been close. They haven't really truly accomplished you know, line item championship sort of things very much in the past 15 years. Uh, and a lot of that, I honestly think, is Rick and his development. I mean, they've lost a lot of players just to general attrition. Um, I mean, they're constantly having guys suspended. They just had another highly touted running back, right, that on their roster that uh, got popped for weed, and now he's going to be suspended indefinitely. And, I mean, it's a guy that's not panning out, but I mean, that's kind of the story for Georgia sometimes is that they get these guys that don't really pan out, don't really go anywhere. And uh, especially you look at all the secondary players, you get guys like Trey Matthews starting for Auburn. That was a very highly touted recruit that signed with Georgia. Uh, and, you know, Nick Marshall, another highly touted defensive back ended up playing quarterback at Auburn. So yeah, I, I do think it comes into play. I think it personally reflects poorly on Mark Richt. I know a lot of people love him. I'm sure he's a great guy from everything I've heard, but I, I am a very strong believer that you have to be very careful with programs like this because teams trend in a direction up or down. And if you wait to fire somebody until you're already at one end or the other of that spectrum, uh, it does a tremendous amount of damage. You know, I think Arkansas, when they came off for Trino and they 
Uh, they got John L. Smith, and they kind of thought they'd float for a year. Petrino hadn't been recruiting well. John L. Smith sort of tanked them. And Arkansas you know, fans now, already don't like us, and now you're reminding <laughs> them of John L. Smith. Come on, man. Well, I, what I'm saying here, though, is I, I don't think people give enough credit to where they were at when Belima started with that job. And I think they're actually getting better slowly, but surely they're building up that program a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, another example I think is probably Missouri right now. I think if you're Missouri, you have to be extremely careful because they did have a lot of results uh, prior. But now under the current coaching staff, I, you know, you got to really question it. They're not, I mean, they were never recruited great, but I'm not even sure they're finding the sort of gems they used to find and the results aren't there. And at some point, uh, you know, it, and it only takes a few years. If you let yourself get to the point where you're winning two games a season or something, uh, it's very difficult to climb out of that hole. And if you're a Missouri is there any way because I feel like there's some teams who who send guys to the NFL and I'm not talking about the Alabamas and the LSUs of the world but I'm there are teams out there that tend to send players into the NFL and they kind of have that level of consistency and they can build on that is is Missouri sending Charles Harris in the first round it was like 20 20 second pick? Is that something that they can build on recruiting, or is it one of those one-offs that is you're losing a good player and you're not going to be able to to backfill with, with that talent because it's not something you can build on? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it's notable that that's their only pick in the draft, right? Uh, but I don't know how much it helps them considering the recruiting has never been great. It's not like they've ever signed tons of five-star uh, pass rushers yet they seem to produce them and if you go way back and look at uh, my preview for last year my whole discussion of Missouri was I felt like the remarkable success they'd had in taking kind of no-name players and turning them into NFL draft picks wasn't sustainable that the reality is it's always a crapshoot with these three stars and you know the reality is a lot of three stars are going to end up being draft NFL players um, and something like half the first round every year ends up being three-star players. But the other side of it is that for every four-star, there are something like 100 three-stars. And for every five-star, it's even you know even higher, more of a proportion. So it's, it's always a bit of a dice roll, and it's like going to a roulette. You know, I, I always use a roulette analogy that people say, you know, let's hit black three times, I'm going to roll black again. And, you know, the truth is that's not at all how it works. It doesn't matter how many times it's hit black. It may have hit the last seven times. You still got a 50-50 shot if it's red or black this time. Um, And I think it's kind of the same thing. I mean, when you consider the fact that the recruiting hasn't been great, that doesn't make me think it's going to have a huge impact on recruiting. And I don't think it's any indication that they have some sort of magic crystal ball that they can tell they have elite talent. Um, And I don't know, at least they didn't lose a ton of guys that were super talented. They just lost that one dude, but that one dude was probably the most talented player on a team that wasn't very good otherwise. So, uh, you know, I mean, Missouri is not in great shape as a program, and I'm I'm very concerned about that program and where they're headed. Okay, so we talked about how you can push a, a ton of guys into the league, not have the results on the field, and it's 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 a pretty heavy indictment of your program. Let's talk about maybe if we can, maybe there's not one, but a team in the SEC that they might be a little down on their uh, their draft performance, but they shouldn't be because the results on the field would indicate that their coaching staff is getting the absolute most out of out of the players that they can. Is there a team in the SEC? that we can maybe lift the fan spirits with a little bit of love uh, or, or does not, or just one not exist. Um, again, the first one I would say I've already touched on is Georgia. Um, I mean, it's unusual for them to only have one guy drafted and in the fifth round at that, but I think it's just a sign of the fact that the team was genuinely young. Uh, and it's a sign that where they were at with Kirby smart was more an indication of where the talent level was at. And in terms of other examples, I mean, it's hard to say too much, right? Because all the SEC teams, by and large, did well. I mean, the 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 exa- only teams with less than four draft picks were Arkansas at three, Georgia at one, Mississippi State at one, and Missouri at one. Um, we all kind of know where Mississippi State's at. You know, they've got some young talent. Uh, that quarterback is is 
you know, I, I don't know that he's truly that special. I know that's a horrible thing for me to say, um, you know, but I mean, he's not, I don't think Dak Prescott, but I do think he's probably a very good quarterback and he certainly will be that way when he's done. Uh, so I think they're, you know, almost bound to get better. Similarly, Arkansas returning their quarterbacks probably going to be a good shape. Uh, you know, losing two pretty good defensive ends is never a great thing in this league, but I think both of those schools, you genuinely can look back and say, well, we didn't really lose all that much. And again, you know, like in Arkansas's case, I don't know that you don't look back at it and go, well, you know, maybe what we thought we were losing wasn't as important to our team, um, you know, as we initially thought. You know, Dan Skipper was this constant talking point at 6'10", 309 as an offensive tackle it goes undrafted and a lot of people are super disappointed when stuff like that happens or you know drew morgan goes undrafted keon hetcher goes undrafted brooks ellis and these are all named players to arkansas but i think it's more an indication of the named players you have on your football team were not really nfl prospects they're and named so by repl- default because somebody's right. got to catch the passes Right. And the flip side to that, though, is it means they're a lot easier to replace than you were initially guessing. And in fact, it's not all that hard for you to end up replacing them with somebody that may end up being a better football player. Uh, And, you know, you hate to say the word overrated because everybody gets really defensive about that and their team and their players. But it's not a bad thing for someone to say the guy that you won't have playing for you anymore was overrated because that means you didn't lose as much as you thought you did. And I think of anybody, I'm going to narrow it down and say it's probably Arkansas, uh, because they just, you know, they did lose several guys, but only a few of them were honestly kind of marginal NFL players. Even Diedrich Wise, who was considered this high ceiling guy, he only went in the fourth round. Uh, So, I mean, I I just don't think they really lost that much compared to what a lot of people are going to think. I I was one final point at least in, on the, in the immediate on Arkansas, I was surprised with all the tight ends having a premium put on, put on them to see Jeremy Sprinkle go as late as he did. I guess it's because he doesn't fit the new NFL tight end mold of basically a tall wide receiver, and he's more of a true tight end who actually blocks. Um, and I know you have a little bit of a, a beef with people who – who like to heap a, a ton of praise on tight ends who don't block, maybe talk about that for a minute in terms of what the NFL sees in the tight end position and whether or not Jeremy Sprinkle was undervalued. So for, I guess, those that haven't really f- tracked the NFL too much, uh, the current trend in the NFL is that quarterbacks are getting very good. Uh, and even top-shelf receivers in the NFL – are having a hard time separating from corners and press man coverage. So what a lot of teams are starting to do, and you know, it, it sounds cliche, but you know, there's 32 teams and the cliche is the rule of thumb in the NFL is they follow the Gronk model where if you have a big tight end that can catch the ball out of the backfield, it's a lot easier for that tight end to get separation on a linebacker than it is for your receivers to get separation on a corner and where everybody has good hands. And when the quarterback can deliver the ball very accurately, You know, if your tight end is consistently open for eight yards, you'll take that each and every play and march your way down the field, Uh, mainly just, again, because quarterbacks like Drew Brees or Tom Brady uh, are able to deliver the ball accurately and consistently. So a lot of teams in the NFL are valuing tight ends. Now, where I have beef is when the tight ends aren't very effective as inline blockers. It generally defeats the point. Again, we were saying that the problem is receivers can't get separation from the corners. Corners are getting taller and they're getting a lot more athletic. If your tight end can't block in line, that means the defense does not have to respect him as a blocker, which means they can bring in an extra defensive back or use a safety to cover him and not have to worry about the numbers game running the football. Mm -hmm. The thing that the tight end causes in terms of a numbers issue is the fact that he could be an inline blocker, so you have to keep the linebacker in there for the run game. Uh, The moment that threat's gone, uh, it really devalues what the tight end is able to do schematically. So, uh, you know, if you have a tight end and you're splitting him out wide, which, you know, like Evan Ingram is a pretty good example at Ole Miss, that he gets split out wide a lot. Uh, If he's constantly split out wide, then he's functionally just a receiver. And if he's just a receiver... Uh, then I can put a corner on him. And at that point, it's just a matter of his height. 
Uh, and not only is it just his height, but he's not going to outrun an NFL DB or even an NFL safety by any means. So you're just purely really going off his ability to out jump the corner to the ball. And considering the athleticism of corners, you don't want to be throwing the ball in their area consistently. That leads to interceptions, which are kind of a terrible thing to have in the NFL. So that's it's just not a good game plan. And that's, I think, why the best NFL receivers or, you know, and I say best NFL receiving tight ends are good inline blockers. It's not that they really need them in the run game to be effective or that it impacts the run game. It's the fact that they can impact the run game, makes the defense respect that aspect of them, makes the defense keep linebackers in the field and treat them as a tight end. And if they're treated like a tight end, that's when they can be truly effective. So I I guess it's interesting to me. I'm looking at, I'm looking at Auburn's picks right now. Uh, It's a harsh transition from Arkansas to Auburn in terms of not having a smooth segue, but it's, it's kind of, they're really confusing to me because we see the recruiting rankings every year. And for you Auburn fans, this is going to seem like we're beating up on your team a little bit. Please refer to all our previous videos last year, including where we picked you to beat Oklahoma and you let us down. Um, it seems to me like Auburn every year is top 10, top five type team, maybe a little bit slipping in the last couple of years in terms of recruiting rankings. Um, but they've got the double whammy of not having the performance on the field and not having the performance in the draft, which to me creates this cyclical negative recruiting effect that at some point is going to take hold. Now, explain to me how... Auburn, who has, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, their four draft picks. The first one went 29th pick in the third round. Uh, Montrevious Adams, who I actually do think will keep a pretty good NFL career. And then Carl Lawson, who everybody was pretty high on this year, um, had an okay season. Um, fourth round, ninth pick. Talk about Auburn for a minute and, and tell me – is there something going on down there in terms of player development or is it scheme or is all of this much to do about nothing and Auburn's fine. They just had a couple of bumps in the road. Well, honestly, I I don't think it's a great thing. You know, Auburn has not had a great draft the past few years. And, you know, I going back to something I said early in the segment, I said, when you have a great draft or surprisingly good draft, Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing. And the best example I gave was when you have a team that you're surprised how well the guys do in the draft or how high they go. That's not good because that means you had a lot of really good players that never really showed it out on the field under your current coaching staff. That's a sign of poor coaching and poor utilization of talent. But the other thing I said is, you know, while it may be, you know, the better your draft, the more you've lost, at the same time, consistently good drafts do drive good programs. It brings in more talent. People see how many you're drafting. It inspires the kids on your team that they want it to be their payday. And when kids look up and they see that they're, you know, they're, uh, that school isn't sending guys in the draft or their teammates aren't being drafted, uh, that, and they see how hard their teammates work to get drafted and not to make that, you know, hit that bar. It's, it's, it's not good. It has a negative effect. In Auburn's case specifically, you know, Montrevious Adams and Carl Lawson were both five-star prospects, um, and there's only 30, 35 of those a year. Those were very, very good talents coming out of high school, and to see them go in the third and fourth round, frankly, is rather concerning. With Auburn, I think the scheme does affect things quite a bit. Uh, I think it's it's really bad on both sides of the ball when it comes to the NFL draft, and, and the reason for that offensively is – the things that they emphasize offensively, both in recruiting and on the field. A lot of people focus on the, you know, how they train and whatnot, but the truth is they're recruiting for this spread system. They want receivers that are sort of quick, simple route running guys, you know, guys that are really good on the bubble screen, really good on jet sweeps, or guys that can just run straight down the field on a fly and catch you on a wears and an RPO. They don't look for guys with great uh, capability on the route tree. And that's significant because it means the ideal Auburn receiver, be it a four star or five star or three star doesn't have the same NFL measurables as the ideal receiver for 
someone at, say, Texas A&M, where they have a little bit more of a sophisticated passing game. Um, and likewise, I think the scheme does affect them a lot of times, both offensive, and offensively and defensively in terms of how they train game to game. You know, the, a lot of the guards and tackles, you see Kozan and left. I mean, Kozan was considered an all-conference player. He doesn't even get drafted. Why? It's because he's a great, you know, grinding guard that was hard-nosed, but he wasn't taught complicated schemes and protections. He wasn't really ever asked to be an elite pass blocker. They really never ran in his career, you know, true three and five step drops in a passing game. They tried to a little bit with Jeremy Johnson and that did not go well. So, you know, there's no tape for him. There's no training. He doesn't have nearly the experience of anybody else has that position and it hurts them. Likewise, defensively and the guys that get, did get drafted is notable. All four of them were actually defensive players. Uh, as opposed to Malzahn's, you know, I guess reputation as an offensive genius. It's interesting that all the drafted players are actually defensive guys. The defenders in practice don't get a lot of quality, impactful reps. And when I say that, I mean Malzahn's approach, and we've talked about this a number of times, is to get clean reps with a minimal amount of contact to perfect the timing and perfect the execution of the play. Um, must champ changed that and fought back a little bit and got more contact in practice when he was the coordinator. Unsurprisingly, they did a lot better defensively. Uh, this past year, I think I think Malzahn's backed off on that a little bit from everything I've heard, and the defense was better. But at the same time, these guys just simply haven't been day out and day out trained. And I think it's also why you see Malzahn be successful at the onset of when he started the coaching job. He does well with transfer players in that he really focuses on instilling the system. And you have very limited amount of practice time. So if you take guys and you say this, wherever you're at right now, we're going to spend as much time as we can to learn how to execute the plays that I want to run. You're going to be pretty good that year because they're going to run the plays well. The problem is three years from now, that freshman that wasn't playing, you never taught him how to block and tackle. You never taught him fundamental football. And it shows up a little bit in the draft in that their players are very good at executing their schemes and they produce well but they're not really great football players and they're not in a great position for another team, say an NFL team to take those players and plug them into their different system and get them to execute. Uh, and I, I don't know that there's a solution for it. I think what they're doing works for them as a college team, but I, I don't think it really works for an NFL team looking to get their players. And at some point it has to have a negative impact that their players aren't being good fits in the NFL and they're not getting. Drafted. Yeah. And I can't, really see it much any other way i i want to give them the benefit of the doubt because i feel like auburn has this pedigree and and has a winning uh tradition under gus but they the the results in the draft are starting to come in line with the results in the field and for us we think okay auburn had some injuries at quarterback last year and they had some issues at defense before. And so it's always like something that we give an excuse if Auburn doesn't go 10, 11, 12 wins, but it's becoming a pattern, isn't it? Like, like we're finding reasons to explain away either lack of quarterback development, lack of defense or whatever. Um, but the results in the field are starting to marry with the results in the draft. And it might be one of those situations where maybe they're just not that talented. So is this a situation where Auburn is super talented and they're taking five stars and turn them into three stars or Auburn's not evaluating very well in the recruiting process and they're, taking five stars on paper that are actually three stars. I know you said Adams and Lawson were, were pretty, pretty high talent guys. What do you think? Is it, is it more Auburn system? I know you just said a lot about Auburn system or is it an evaluation issue? I, again, I do think it's both. Uh, I think sometimes when you talk about evaluation, again, they're evaluating to a very different set of criteria. I think it's the first thing you've got to keep in mind. So, a lot of this has to be tempered, particularly offensive talent. They may be evaluating them correctly, but they're evaluating them for a spread offense, for a very spreadish offense. And it's a little bit like Oregon in that some of Oregon's most productive players that are small and fast or whatnot aren't really in any way a fit for the NFL. Auburn has a little bit of that problem at times in that their their evaluation just doesn't match the NFL. So what they put higher on the board is not going to be a very good NFL player. 
but at the same time, there's something to be said that you have a lot of armored guys taken low or they don't seem to pan out as much as they should. Uh, and I give you a pretty good example. Um, and it's a guy that I thought in college was a really dangerous weapon that kind of got used as a trick role player and it hit how good he was. That was CJ Uzuma, the tight end. I really felt like what Uzuma did for them, that going back to the discussion we had earlier about how tight ends are dominating the NFL, they would use him as an inline blocker and motion him out all the time. And teams just had no idea what to do with Uzuma because he was a fantastic inline blocker uh, and he would blow out a hole. And then, so they, you know, try to bring a big linebacker in, they'd flex wide and put Uzuma on the outside and they couldn't cover him. You know, Last year, Uzuma ended up having a pretty darn successful season with the Cincinnati Bengals and had 25 receptions, two, over 200 yards. I mean, not you know break, setting the world on fire, but you know he's a serious NFL player, uh, and he was a fifth round draft pick, 157th. Not really all that notable. So I I think that's kind of a decent example of how you know maybe if Auburn ran a more traditional offense. Uh, and he was a more traditional tight end. People might have realized how good he was, and he might have been trained more as a traditional tight end. But Auburn didn't teach him a regular route tree. Uh, they didn't teach him how to really operate as an inline tight end in a pro set, uh, and still do everything out of that. And so it, you know, it set him back. Okay, so that's Auburn. Let's go from a team that really didn't have a great draft to a team that blew it out of the water. Uh, and that's LSU, multiple first rounders, uh, second, third round guys, really out of their giant group of players that got drafted, all but two were in the first three rounds. So this is a team that their draft mirrors their recruiting rankings. Their draft looks like a team that you'd expect to be, you know, 11 12 game winner in the thick of it at the end of the year and we know what happened to lsu last year we know what happened to les miles last year um but this is starting to become a recurring theme in our discussions where we have a team that's that was clearly either stacked with talent or nfl gms are just in love a little bit over enamored with the measurables of the guys coming out of there um but talk about lsu in terms of um we saw their their results on the field last year. If you see this kind of draft, are you disappointed as an LSU fan for what you put on the field last year? And what kind of outlook does it give you going forward? Well, I think the first thing to say is LSU's record at eight and four wasn't fantastic, but we really weren't shocked that that was the regular season record, right? I mean, the losses to Alabama is pretty forgivable. I mean, that was a tight game. Tight loss to Florida may be questionable, but Florida, when they wanted to be, were a very good team. Same thing could be said of Auburn. Um, we, you know, actually in our opening thing last year, said that the Wisconsin game was going to be a knife fight for LSU just simply because that was literally the worst possible matchup in the country for what LSU was and what they were trying to do. Again, kind of going back to that, Wisconsin was the third-ranked rush defense the year prior and returned everybody in the front seven. Um, when you're a pounded football team, the last thing you want to do in your opener is play an extremely veteran defense that was phenomenal against the run the year prior. So that wasn't too surprising. Um, I think really the Auburn loss was the one bad loss in that set. I, they really should have beaten Auburn, and Auburn's record would have looked a lot different if they'd won that game. But beyond that... Everything was kind of fell in the realm of predictability. That said, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of talent. And I think you have to kind of groan a little bit if you're an LSU fan because, you know, I mean, this is one of the more talented teams they've had in terms of, you know, high-level draft talent. I think after the Alabama-LSU game, we walked away from that. I think both of us felt, and I know I commented on this, that I thought Duke Riley might have actually been a better player than Kendall Beckwith. You know, Beckwith got all the hype, but I really felt like Duke Riley was quietly special. And, you know, Riley did get end up being drafted higher. But I, I think some, to some degree, little things like that are very telling that you had a guy that was actually a fantastic linebacker and you used him as sort of a, I won't say quite role player, but situational outside linebacker. 
Um, and I don't know that you re they really leveraged the talent the way they should have. I mean, the defense was very good, and they were great through the season. Even in their losses, the defense played their hotter out. But, you know, Malachi Dupree may have been a seventh-round player, but he's still a pretty solid receiver. Uh, you have a fourth pick in the draft at running back. Um, you have a second-round pick at center. So, you know, at some level, you, I, mean, I mean, they were successful pounding the football. I, I really think it with LSU, it all comes down to the fact that that was a very good football team that didn't really have a great offensive identity. And most importantly, you cannot play the game of football if you don't have a quarterback. And as bad as the quarterbacks looked at times, I honestly think they were probably worse than people even realized. I think they weren't asked to do much at all, and it hit it. And, you know, again, having watched that Alabama game, and I don't know if you agree with me, but that was one of the most painful games on both sides of the ball to watch the quarterback play that I have ever seen from two like top 10 teams. Would you agree with me on yeah, that? It's pretty amazing talking about Alabama, how every like LSU could have held up a sign from the sideline that said corner blitz it's coming. And uh, Alabama had to know it was coming and they absolutely did not possess either the quarterback or the scheme or whatever to, to adjust. And that was, I think kind of a rookie quarterback issue. LSU, my goodness. I mean, they did nothing. It was very similar in my opinion to the Washington Alabama game. Uh, and they had all the opportunities in the world to win that game. Um, and it's interesting talking about quarterback play um, and I know I think you had a couple more points, but I don't want to forget this. Malachi Dupree, to me, might be the most underrated seventh round pick ever. I think he's got first or second round ability, but had really no production to show for it. Mostly not of any fault of his own. What do you think? Uh, you know, I... I there's a pretty good chance I'd agree with you. Draven Doral and Malachi Dupree from everything I ever saw were very capable receivers. And that offense for pretty much your entire tenure was incapable of getting them the football. And, you know, it's not like there's been, a, you know, some sort of theoretical past history where uh, LSU has had these high level wide receivers that it turns out were just, really uh, hidden by offensive ineptitude that blow up in the NFL. But, you know, if that was a universe we lived in, I could see, you know, I'm not saying Malachi Dupree would make strange one-handed catches. I mean, it's such a weird hypothetical, isn't it, on the sidelines. But I, I do think that those two guys could end up being solid NFL receivers. And, you know, honestly, I, I think it's truly a case where the NFL has no film. I don't even mean, like, good film, bad film. They didn't have enough catchable passes thrown their way to make an impact to show up on film what they can do. Uh, but to sort of wrap around it in this discussion, because, you know, we've, I think, belabored the point long enough. Seven defensive starters uh, just left this team. Five of the seven uh, were, you know, as you as you said, uh, high draft picks. I mean, four of the seven were uh, first three round draft picks. So. LSU loses about as much like high level talent as anybody in the country. Maybe in some ways, maybe more high level talent. Uh, you know, Alabama might have an argument with that, but um, considering the fact that I don't see their quarterback situation getting fixed, it, it's very concerning because the defense certainly did prop them up to a large degree, and the quarterback is going to completely hold back the offense, no matter what talent is around him. Uh, so the defense has to be at a very high level and any step back, which you're likely to see defensively is going to have some serious repercussions when it comes to the win loss record. Okay. So I know one more thing on LSU. I know you were really high on Jamal Adams all year. I was too. Um, the fact that he was picked sixth aside, if you're looking at LSU's draft class this year and you had to make a prediction for which one is going to have the best NFL career, is it Jamal Adams or is it somebody else? It's that's tough. I think it probably will be Jamal Adams. Um, but the, the only, you know, the, oddly the one that I'm considering maybe is Tredavious white. I don't think Leonard Fournette's going to be as successful as Adams or white, but that's just me personally. Okay. Well, I would say that 
I think Leonard Fournette is going to have a good NFL career. I think his entire career has had so much hype behind it that he's going to dip- disappoint a lot of people. And it's probably not fair yeah. to him. I, I think it's one of those situations, kind of like we hear with Bama busts. You know, they only have like eight guys in the Pro Bowl every year. But when the the people who don't really follow it, in their mind, they remember Trent Richardson or they remember a one-off here or there. And in their mind, all the NFL players at Bama sends, they're all busts. Well, if you count being an NFL starter by your second year and having a seven, eight year career as a bust, then maybe we're looking at a Leonard Fournette bust. I don't think he's going to be a Zeke Elliott or, and it's probably too early for him, but like a big time, massive MVP style running back. And I fear that anything short of that is going to be a disappointment. Is that fair? I think it is. I don't think, and I think Fournette is the sort of guy that if he'd gone to a good team, he would have been very successful. But the and we've talked about this before. When you have big running backs, their disadvantage is they have a hard time redirecting with uh, early on. Uh, you know, in in when they get the ball because there there's too much mass and momentum to build up, and it's hard for them to just immediately change direction and avoid a tackler in the backfield. They really need a hole. And if they get a hole and they get to the second level, their size advantage really comes into play when they're going up against linebackers and defensive backs. A 240-pound running back in the NFL is going to get tackled by a DN just like a 200-pound running back. Uh, you know, the size and strength of the defensive lineman is just too great. And sometimes the running backs can break tackles, and I get that. But to a large degree, you're not going to ever truck an NFL defensive lineman if you're an RB. You're just not going to do it. Um, and so Fournette going to the Jaguars, I think we'll, we'll hold him back. And it's a little bit like he said, and I think you were saying the Bama bust, the example that comes to mind to me is Mark Ingram, who sometimes gets labeled as a bust. And the kid went to the Pro Bowl. <laughs> so it's not like he's been, you know, he's an NFL starter, played in the Pro Bowl, has had some injury issues. I get that. But, you know, I think, you know, I'm just not sure where the bar is set. I think Fournette will have a better career than Mark Ingram. Um, but, I don't know that he'll ever live up to the fourth pick in the draft sort of hype that they're building for him, as you, I think, aptly noted. All right, so moving over to the SEC East, got to give them a little bit of love. Tennessee deserves some love. Uh, Tennessee is one of those teams that frequently is positioned as next year is our year. We're on the upswing. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna build on what we did last year. Um, and for a while, it looked like they were going to run away with the East. Didn't do so well down the stretch, including a loss to Vanderbilt. Um, so one would think maybe that wasn't a team that was loaded with talent. And this year will be their year. But if you look down the list, six guys go in the draft, including Jalen Reeves Mabin, Cameron Sutton, Josh Malone, Kamara Dobbs, and Derek Barnett. So... I would argue, even though LSU lost more players, I would argue there's not a team in the SEC that lost more key players if they want to build any momentum for this season. Doesn't mean they're going to have a bad season, and this is just my guess, Uh, but what would you say in terms of, not, not numbers, but key players? They didn't have a ton of top line draft picks. They had three half their players went in the fourth um but you know like a guy like Jalen Reese Mabin that's a key player to key position so is that a fair thing to say about Tennessee that out of all the teams in the SEC nobody lost more key players at key positions I don't know about saying that no one lost more key players but I'm not sure that anyone lost more players they relied on. Uh, I might put it that way. Uh, and and that's what I'm saying for them, not necessarily right, impacting yeah, the NFL, it, but matters to them. I, I don't know. I, I think that's, I think it's quite possibly a, a fair take on it. Uh, and I think looking into it, it looks like, you know, I think up to seven defensive starters may be gone. It, it, I say up to it's, it's always hard to say these things these days because the, they everything's so multiple. It's hard to say what is and isn't a defensive starter in a given formation. But when you go back and looking like trying to pull up a projected depth chart right now for Tennessee, 
I'm not really sure who the best player on their defense will be. Um, you know, they losing Vereen and Barnett, and then you lose Maben, you lose Sutton. Um, and then offensively, you know, Dobbs, Kamara, Hurd, Josh Malone. It's, it's the guys that sort of made the team tick. And, you know, they, I think Jennings turned out to be a pretty solid receiver. Uh, their offensive line should be pretty good, but I mean, it's exactly what you're saying. When you look at skill talent and when you look at impact players defensively, I don't really know what's there. Uh, and that's kind of a scary proposition. I mean, the truth is Jones, Butch Jones hasn't really recruited at a very high level. He's recruited solidly, but the problem with solid is they weren't landing those sort of elite prospects at least. And they certainly didn't seem to be really developing them. And this, you know, we said this last year in the lead up to this past season, that that was their year looking at their depth chart and where the team was. And you know, that it's, you usually have about a two year window where the juniors and seniors all line up, you know, the draft draftable juniors and the seniors that'll stick around another year and aren't maybe aren't a first round pick, but they're a third round pick if they stay their senior year. And that was this past season. And, you know, that's the Joshua Dobbs as a senior, Derek Barnett as a junior kind of thing. Uh, and the fact that they didn't get the success they wanted means they are going to have to reset. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you. It, it, there may be some unknown guys that step forward. And of course you're going to hear about how great they are coming out of spring because, you know, if you lose everybody on both sides of the ball, I'm not saying they do, but it's always funny to me, right? If you have a team that completely resets and if you're just end up being really bad the next year, the, the one above average guy on offense at receiver will destroy your terrible secondary because the secondary is terrible. So now all of a sudden you get the idea that this receiver is great. So you don't know anything coming out of spring. And I mean, that was a bad example. I tend to go to the negative example more than the positive, but the point is, you know, if the, you hear scrimmages that the offense can't move the ball, maybe it means the young defensive players are, are stepping up. Uh, but the reality from what we've seen, yeah, I, I, that's a lot of production and more than production. It's a lot of impact production. They're the guys that really made the plays. And I, uh, it's tough to see them being really nearly the same team next year. I hate to say it. If we're going to spin kind of our negative take, which we do frequently have a negative take uh, into a positive for Tennessee, I wonder you weren't super high on Josh Dobbs all last year. And it proved a little bit prophetic uh, down the stretch. Uh, some of the things we said after the first and second week, um, <sighs> Is there some silver lining here that, yes, you're losing your multi-year starting quarterback, but it's a guy who maybe was a little overrated? Is is there some, some for Tennessee fans, is there some hope there that, that maybe that's not one position that they're going to get crushed and having to replace? I, I definitely think there is. Um, I honestly think it's possible that Josh Dobbs was – drafted overly high even in the fourth round and I say that just because he's such a good likable kid and he's such a smart kid you can talk to him and sort of talk yourself into him being a good football player um, when the reality is and you know it's what we projected going into this year mainly that his accuracy had been very consistently mediocre throughout his entire career and it really hadn't improved and it hadn't improved at the start of the season so we didn't expect it to improve throughout the rest of the year um, so I, I think Josh Dobbs was kind of always what he was and he was serviceable, but he was never really anything more than that. And he was never going to be very accurate with the football, which means he's replaceable. I mean, you, you get three players drafted. The best of them's Alvin Kamara, who is, you know, very highly hyped as a player, but ends up being a third round pick. Go back to the very, one of the very first things we said in this. And if you, it was, it's often a good thing short term. If you look at where you guys were drafted and you thought they were very high level picks and they got drafted a couple of rounds later than you were expecting. What that means is the NFL is saying, we don't think that this loss is as significant as you think it is. And that means it's a lot more replaceable. Uh, again, you know, Tennessee has a strong foundation in that they were returning almost the entire offensive line. You know, they're very experienced up front. And considering that the skill players really, as it turns out, probably weren't all that elite, that also means that they were quite replaceable. So if you get some pretty consistent production from the newcomers at some of those skill positions, given the quality of the offensive line, all of a sudden you can have a serviceable offense 
you know, almost by default because your offensive line's good and, and you can continue to compete. So if that, that would be my silver lining for the Tennessee Volunteers next year. All right, so one more team in the SEC East that I want to talk about that put a ton of players in the draft, and you might not expect it if you don't follow them, and that's the Florida Gators. Uh, it makes sense to me because it explains that consistency in winning. We think about the East the last few years being a little bit down, not being that great, um, but then we see Florida consistently winning in the East um, in two years in a row facing Alabama in Atlanta. So – Looking at the players that they put in the NFL, does that kind of make sense in terms of not only the winning, but the players that they put in the NFL kind of explain, okay, you beat a really good team last week. You stubbed your toe this week on a team you had no business losing to, but then, oh, you're favored against LSU or, you know, whatever. So can you explain that? Does their draft class explain that? Um, There's been some up and down inconsistency there. Uh, what do we make of Florida? Well, uh, you know, all of this really at some level has to come back to recruiting, right? And I think the short answer is Will Muschamp was really good at evaluating and developing defensive talent, and he wasn't very good at evaluating offensive talent. Um, you know, Jeff Triscoll was like the number one dual threat quarterback, and he transferred because he wasn't any good. Uh, Kelvin Taylor was a five star running back, uh, and you know, he ended up being solid, but certainly not a five star. You know, he was actually, you know, he and Derrick Henry, for those that don't know, kind of jockeyed back and forth for the top uh, running back. And I think that was the 2013 class. Um, and so sort of those missed evaluations, the, if you want to call it that, really came back to bite them offensively. But throughout it all, they did recruit at a high level uh, and they had a ton of talent. I think they were third in the overall uh in in fact they were 24 7 sports as like a composite ranking of all the different services third nationally in 2013 you know if you think 13 14 15 16 17 etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean that's the sort of the cusp of the current guys being drafted 2014 was the next year they were a top 10 class but their top 10 classes stopped at 2014 so 13 14 were top top, I think third and like seventh. And then they were outside the top 10 every year after 2014. So 15, 16, uh, and now 17. And so, you know, what does that really translate to? Well, it means that you you had a lot of really high level talent in this current crop that went to the NFL and you didn't have a ton of talent behind them. And you, the offensive part side of the ball had a lot of really bad evaluations. And unsurprisingly that, correlates to the fact that you had a really good defense and didn't have a great offense. This isn't rocket science, obviously. I mean, if you have good top players in offense, good players in defense, and you're going to have a good defense and a good uh, bad offense, and, you know, it all kind of meshes up. Uh, but, you know, this defense in particular was really stacked with that, like, 2013, 2014 classes. Uh, seven defensive starters getting drafted in one draft is a pretty crazy number. Uh, but I think it's also interesting to sort of break down where those players were. And I think it, that explains a fair amount in that, you know, you have two second round picks at corner. Um, you have a second round pick at safety. And so you've got, you know, in your secondary, you've got three, uh, you know, first, second day NFL players, like really high level talents. Uh, Gerard Davis goes in the first round at linebacker. Uh, Anzalone goes in the third round. So, you know, you look at that back seven and I mean, that's pretty darn serious. Now, what about the front four? Brantley's a six round pick. Ivy's the seventh. Brian Cox Jr. goes undrafted. And I think that's kind of your answer a little bit with Florida in that at times when they got sort of punched in the mouth, they didn't have the depth and physicality to hold as well as you think they should. A couple of times games got away from them when other teams started, you know, getting momentum and got the ball a lot. Um, and the secondary players in the back seven, when they got tired, you know, they can't make every play and, and they just didn't have that rotation. So, you know, when they played the Tennessee game where that game drug out and, and they kind of got it handed to them and the, especially that Alabama game, which mainly hinted off the fact in the SEC championship that they had a number of turnovers offensively and on special teams that generated points, put them in a hole and all of a sudden Alabama could play, you know, grinded out football for the rest of the ball game. Uh, at some point the defense got tired and I think it, Honestly, a lot of times I think the defense just 
basically lost heart because they knew the offense wasn't going to score points or was going to give more points to the other team than they did their own. But I, I think that's sort of the the greater story here is Muschamp, for all his faults, did recruit and develop exceptionally well on the defensive side of the football. I think it was reflected in this draft. Um, and honestly, it is a little bit concerning that the recruiting classes after he left have not been top 10 classes. And you can think, well, 10 to 20 isn't a bad class. Well, that may be true in most conferences. It's really not true in the SEC. Uh, you know, if you look at a team like Georgia, and that, you know, when Florida was third nationally, in 2013, Georgia was 12th nationally. And you think, oh, that's solid, right? Well, where is Georgia in the SEC? At 12th nationally, you know, that puts them 7th in the conference. 12th nationally is in the bottom half uh, of the conference. So you start to see why, you know, slipping outside that top 10 rankings, you very quickly fall out of that elite status. Again, there's a big gap too, between those top three to five teams in the recruiting rankings. And then there's everybody sort of in a clump behind them. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if Florida can continue to kind of sustain that, sustain that success and despite themselves, uh, because on one hand, I think their offense is starting to get their act together a little bit. Uh, and I think, Honestly, I think McIlwain's a good coach, and I think he's had to figure out how to get pieces uh, to fit what were a lot of really big missing holes offensively. Um, but now, you know, he's going to have to build that offense up into something cohesive, and he's going to have to really coach up rather than coaching exceptional talent uh, in a lot of positions and trying to make it work with bad players and a few others. He's got to make an all around good team and see if he can sustain the same results without the sort of ultra high level talents that he's had defensively uh, to help him in the past. So I think this is kind of interesting. Uh, based on what you said about Auburn and the defensive production they had during and maybe a little bit after Muschamp's tenure there, like his fingerprints were on that, is this? Are we seeing the same thing at Florida? Like, like is this a pattern that's repeating where Muschamp was there before? kind of built a certain mentality in the defense and it's lingered a little bit even after he's gone because because the coaching remains or am I just drawing some parallels that that maybe aren't aren't there I I think it's a fair guess I mean who knows right I mean how do you say whether or not a player is good I mean all this at some level speculation just because not only is it a guess what happens behind the scenes but even if you were there at practice every day you still couldn't tell how much of it's the coach and how much is the player and how much it's the player growing. But, you know, I think it's when they considering that they have lost, uh, you know, something like nine of 11 defensive starters, again, considering the package, it's a complete reboot for Florida defensively. And I will be very, very curious to see if the guys that are going to replace these currents, these past starters, the guys that were really tutored under Muschamp, and these new kids that really weren't tutored under Muschamp, if they can maintain the same edge, um, unfortunately, I kind of lean to the fact that they probably won't. And and that means people may be surprised at just how big of a jump back they take defensively. Um, and, you know, that means the offense is going to pick up the slack. And, I mean, it's an interesting thing for going into next season, but uh, now you're going to have to really start worrying about whether they can find a quarterback and make some stuff work because that, that defense is – even more of a question mark, I think, than people realize based off the recruiting and the caliber of talent that was just lost to the draft. So do you know what segment we're at now? We're at the Alabama segment. Uh, you guys kill us in the comments a lot of times saying we spend too much time on Alabama, but when you win as much as they do, we kind of got to talk about them. Um, so Alabama, of course, monster draft as usual. They're, they didn't get going until mid-round, and, and that was uh, the the point of discussion for ESPN. Uh, I know they hammered it during the draft, had a couple of uh, articles for the seven people that are left working there um, to write on their website. But I'm curious, I have my own two selections for this, but I want to hear what yours are and see if they match up with mine. Give me the one Alabama player that was drafted too high, too early, and the one Alabama player who was drafted too low 
and is a lot more valuable than he was given credit. Oh, that's always interesting when you throw these at me at the last minute. All right, guy that was drafted too early. I'm actually probably going to see Cam Robinson. Okay. Um, I, I'm leaning – it's Cam or – there's actually a part of me that says Ryan Anderson may not be physically hold up, you know, be have the physical tools, but I think he's there. So I think it's Cam Robinson and the guy that's drafted too low for me. That's actually kind of easy. I think it's Eddie Jackson and I, I don't, I, I don't even really waver on that. I think it's clearly Eddie Jackson. Cam Robinson is interesting because the Jaguars and we're going to have another segment for those of you who have made it this far, Without falling asleep, we're going to have another segment that discusses kind of how these pieces from the SEC fit into the actual NFL teams because we do talk about SEC football here a lot, but you know we also are interested to see these players in their careers as they progress. Cam Robinson is interesting to me because he was once touted as a lot top 10 pick. He slipped a little bit. Um... And then, honestly, I think if he'd been able to come out the year before, he'd have gone a lot higher. What's interesting is about is where he went. He went to Jacksonville, who's got a lot of offensive line problems. And most, even highly touted left tackles from college, when they transition to the NFL, they start out at right tackle. Even, even a lot of the top five, top ten guys start out at right tackle and kind of get their sea legs. Cam Robinson may actually have to be the starting left tackle for a team who coming into the draft needed to shore up offensive line more than anything else. Is that crazy or is that crazy? I think it's a little nuts. Um, yeah, Robinson, it was weird because he almost felt like he regressed. I feel like this is a trend with Alabama linemen. We saw it. You know, Cyrus Quanjo was this big battle uh, in recruiting between Auburn and Alabama, and he's, you know, like second player overall and came as a started as a freshman. It felt like he was there forever. And then by the time he got drafted, he was good off that, I guess, what was that 2012 line that they had that won that, that title. But then in the NFL, he's kind of petered out. And, you know, DJ Fluker was another example. Andre Smith was another example. They've had a lot of really high level draft picks at linemen that continually all seem like those guys were better almost as a freshman than as a junior. And then they all got even sometimes progressively worse after they left college. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's that they get worked out too much. I got the feel, impression a lot of times that Cam Robinson was banged up, but it's just there's this weird inkling in my mind that he may go down that same path and that Robinson may not really ever improve. In fact, he may regress. Uh, and if he's asked to be in that kind of a role for the Jaguars, like you're talking about, and it may be just purely by default, um, you know, there's nothing worse for a young player than to be put in a losing situation because you form bad habits, you get used to failure, uh, and then you tend to tend to just kind of fall apart. All right, so I'll give you mine. Um, actually, before I give you mine, uh, you talked about Cam Robinson. Uh, I want to hear your why you went with Eddie Jackson. Why do you think he's the biggest value pick uh, of the Bama players in this draft? Well, Eddie Jackson broke his leg uh, later in the year, but I mean, he was still all American caliber player. He was extremely productive. Uh, I thought he was one of the keys to their football team. I mean, he did kind of everything for them. And I was really honestly surprised that he fell as light, low as he did now a lot of it understands the injury issue uh i don't know that he was ever that quick of a football player but i mean he he did ever, kind of everything you wanted he was a converted corner so as a converted corner uh that means that he has you know like general coverage skills that you want to see uh so good kick returner yeah um and what i think is kind of funny about Eddie Jackson is there's a lot of talk about, you know, Peppers and how good Peppers is. Well, when Eddie Jackson was healthy, he had a higher kick return average and a higher punt return average than Peppers. He had more interceptions than Peppers. I think he had more tackles than Peppers. Um, and yet he's a fourth round pick. And I, 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 I kind of wonder how much it was just recruiting and notoriety 
because there really weren't too many players that were more productive at the college level than Jackson. And when you consider the fact that he does actually have cover corner skills, um, that makes him really valuable. I think a lot of why he slid was probably, honestly, the health history. I don't, don't really recall, but I don't think he ever finished a season healthy. Uh, and so that, that I'm sure, hurt him. But, uh, I mean, honestly, I think he has the potential to be maybe as good as anybody else, as crazy as it is for Alabama in this draft. Uh, Alabama, my two picks, the guy that I think was overdrafted, you and I constantly disagree on this, but I'm right, you're wrong. Marlon Humphrey went too high mostly because I think he can be a long career NFL corner. I think he's got all the physical tools, and I think he has some immediate impact abilities, especially in the short game. He's a great tackler, great open field tackler, great in run support. He can cover the short routes. The issue is when you draft a guy at 16th, he's got to start. He's got to start the next year. You've got too much money. You've got too much invested. And you don't want to look like an idiot who overdrafted somebody in the first round that can't play day one. And I just don't know that Marlon Humphrey is a day one starter. I think he would be benefit much more being an understudy, being a second guy, maybe being a slot cover guy, which I don't know that he's equipped to do. Um, but learn for a couple of years. Look at, if we're using Bama players, A.J. McCarron is going to be a much better starting quarterback and his career is going to be much better for it for having sat the bench for a couple of years, a few years. So um, Marlon Humphrey went too early and Reuben Foster is my pick, even though he went in the first round. I know there's a lot of bad negative juju around this guy because of what ever happened at the draft but this is a guy in my opinion um and maybe he slipped a little because of injury concerns and not because of character issues or whatever but in my opinion and you can call me crazy uh, and i'll give you an opportunity to do that in my opinion Ruben foster is the most nfl ready player in this draft he is the most ready to go player without any question, sideline to sideline linebacker that I think in this draft, if I'm saying, all right, out of all the guys that got drafted in the first round, who is the most equipped physically and mentally and ex- experienced to start for their team because first rounders got to start? I'm going with Ruben Foster. Now tell me why I'm wrong. I don't know that I am. Uh, you know, I thought Jackson was like two rounds too late, which is why I had him. But I, I agree with you. You know, the, there's been a lot of talk with the whole trade issue with the 49ers uh, versus you know, the Bears with that second, third pick that the 49ers actually had Reuben Foster as the third player period on the board. And I am not in the least bit surprised by that. I, I think both of us watching this season, we commented several times that we felt like Reuben Foster was the best linebacker we've seen at Alabama in you know, similarly, I think both of us felt like he's probably the best linebacker I've seen in the past several years in the conference. Um, and, you know, there's some of the, like Willis comments made about 49ers. I don't think it's off base. I, I think Foster was almost a hybrid of the physicality of Rolando McClain, who I know was a head case, and CJ Mosley, who is now a perennial pro bowler. Um, I mean, he's, he's got the speed and he's got the size. I question what's between the ears on a lot of levels. Um, it took him way too long to break into that starting rotation at Alabama. So I disagree a little bit when you say pro ready in terms of immediate starter, because I'm curious how well it's going to, how long it's going to take him to crack the NFL lineup, considering it took him a long time to really, you know, break in the lineup at Alabama, even given his talent. But in terms of just physical, like physically prepared to walk in and, and immediately make an impact, I don't disagree one bit. I mean, Reuben Foster is one of the most talented players in this draft. No question, in my opinion. So a lot of people would probably have Jonathan Allen as their pick because some, there was a little bit of heat that said he might be first overall overhead of Miles Garrett. Then he slipped a little bit. Then he slipped a little more. Uh, But going into the draft on draft day, I think a lot of people had him like top eight. Uh, so 
there's probably a lot of Bama fans out there that would say, look, you're talking about all these players that went into the first, fourth round. Jonathan Allen, man, that guy went from what I thought was third down to, to 17th. And there's a ton of Bama fans that are just absolutely beside themselves that Barnett went ahead of him. I think there's a case to be made, obviously, because NFL GMs agreed with me, uh, for Barnett to go ahead of Jonathan Allen. And I know Bama fans are trying to find out where I live so I can throw eggs in my house. But Jonathan Allen, one, I think there's some injury issues floating around with him, some concerns floating around. I I still think he's going to be a great player. Um, But Barnett was a beast. Barnett was a beast without a lot of talent around him. Barnett was getting to the quarterback without, you know, six, seven other guys that were right behind him at the quarterback. So I don't think it's that crazy to say, okay, Barnett ahead of Jonathan Allen is out of this world. I don't think so. Yeah, when we talked about it last year, a couple games Tennessee had where much, it was actually really similar to Miles Garrett that teams were intentionally running plays to avoid, to avoid Derek Barnett. I mean, they were doing everything they could with like the zone read game and whatnot to avoid him, they changed their whole scheme when they played them. That's something people don't get about Garrett and Barnett both, that there's a lot of zone read stuff. Teams would refuse to run the zone read because they knew Barnett and Garrett were so fast and disruptive, they would hit the quarterback and the running back at the mesh point before they could make the read. And so they just didn't execute a whole section of the playbook when they played those teams. It lowered the impact, so they didn't always get the stats, but you know Barnett got the stats anyway. I mean, he was just an absolute monster. And that's not to discredit Jonathan Allen, who was a first-round draft pick. It's just to say that Barnett was also very good. Uh, one of the things I think will always stick in my memory with Allen, though, was the actually the end of that Clemson game, the last Clemson game. Um, they're driving down the field. Alabama's got to get their last stop. And there's a play there where Allen gets double-teamed, and he actually gets pushed to the ground. And I know he's exhausted, and you know they're never going to run anywhere close to that number of snaps. But to me, in terms of just physical, you know, ability to impose one's will, it said a little bit that I don't know that the like sheer core power is there that some other guys have had, uh, especially if you want to be like a top 10 pick. I think Allen is a phenomenal from everything I've read. You know, he's this army brat kid. He's incredibly intense. I think he's going to have a great career, uh, but I get why you might draft somebody else higher because, you know, when you're talking first 15 round pick, it's it's all sort of touched by God level athleticism, and you can be really, really, really good and still not be as good as some of the guys who get drafted higher. The one sleeper who I think was drafted appropriately, so it doesn't fit with our two uh, picks. The one sleeper from Alabama in this draft who I think had a much bigger unsung impact on the defense than people realize is Dalvin Tomlinson. I, I think that guy is a 10, 15-year NFL starter if he can hold up with his health. What do you think? Uh, I totally agree. The moment you started this, I was really curious if that's who you're going to say. Uh, I don't fully, to be honest, understand why he was never discussed that much because he actually did have a lot of production throughout the year. Um, but I think Dalvin Tomlinson is not just a guy that's a good, solid role player, blue-collar player. He's actually a very, very talented player in his own right that I guess just largely due to the level of talent around them and the impact players kind of got overshadowed. Uh, but I, I'm with you. I think he, you know, very high motor guy that's you know actually very quick and disruptive. And, and so a lot of times watching them, I'd be surprised because I felt like Tomlinson was really the most disruptive lineman, not Allen uh, for Alabama. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you. And there, there's actually been, a, I guess, a pretty good track record of Alabama defensive linemen that weren't really all that regarded that have had decent careers. Quentin Dial um, and Brandon Dederick come to mind. Uh, you know, Wallace Gilberry, guys have had multi-year careers that weren't really big name players. And I, I think Tomlinson has the potential to be that kind of a guy. All right. So before we wrap up this first segment of the draft show, I want you to do the same thing here that we did on a couple of others. Tell me the one guy in this list of Bama drafted players that's going to have the best NFL career if you had to call it right now. Um, 
I'm probably going to go with Reuben Foster. Yeah, I mean, that's he was my 1B. My 1A is O.J. Howard, and I think part of it is I think he got put, got selected into the right system. They throw the ball hey. around a lot. You know what? I was going to say, you, I mean, I, I think that's that's a really fair point. Where he ended up was going to be a big deal, but I don't. The lack of production hurts me. I'll let you finish your thought. It's just the lack of production really makes me hesitant with him. Yeah, I think, that, but the lack of production, it's kind of like the Malachi Dupri thing. Like, is it because he's not great, or is it because you've got a quarterback who throws everything at the line of scrimmage? And I think it's more of that. Uh, Clemson would certainly tell you that he's perfectly capable. Um, th- there's two reasons why I think he's going to have a great, great career. One, because of where he went, and two, because he's one of these new style tight ends in the NFL who can block his ass off, and that is so rare. But he can actually be effective in run blocking. And he wasn't that way his freshman year when he first came to Alabama. He was not a good blocker. Um, And the kind of throwaway line that you say about these wide receiver type tight ends, you just assume that they can't block. Mel Kuyper Jr., I'm looking at you. He said that about every tight end that got drafted, whether it was true or not. And for O.J. Howard, it's not true. I think he's a great blocker. I think that's going to keep him on a team for a long time, well beyond his pass-catching prime years. Give me OJ for the best NFL career. Give me Ruben Foster for the one B. Yeah, fair enough. And it, it, I think an interesting thing too with the Bucks is, I, I think back to Jimmy Winston at Florida State, and he really did get a lot of production through the tight end with Nick O'Leary. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, but Nick O'Leary is the grandson. Of- <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> never and it, heard that. Never heard that in a broadcast before. Uh, yeah, uh, but. Yeah, I mean that I, I I think back to that every time I saw that pairing, just how much that you know, Winston relied on you know Jack Nicholson's grandson uh, in the passing game, and uh, I think that probably bodes well for Howard's career. All right, that about wraps it up for our draft show. Again, thanks so much for everybody who listened to this. We apologize greatly for not getting it out when it was a little more you know relevant during the draft time, but we wanted to get this out for people who wanted to listen to something before the 2017 football season gets started. We've got a lot of content coming around the corner, so keep an eye 